Hi, ever wonder what it's like to work another profession or live in the underworld? Listen to Unsuspecting Riders give a 10 to 15 minute personal masterclass as I spontaneously interview them as they enter my taxi. I'm your host, Simon Rushton, and this is Taxi Chronicles. Morning, 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 morning. We have another rider, another episode. Today we have the lovely Sally, and she's going to tell us about the world of pharmaceuticals and how they, it's quite interesting to be honest, how they check what doctors are doing and that they're right. So nice to have you here today, Sally. Hello, good morning. Okay. So first of all, tell us what kind of person you were when you were in school. Um, so in school, my secondary school life was pretty much all about academia, um, learning as much as possible, um, was pretty much called a teacher's pet, um, hang around with the girls' school. I went to a girls' secondary school, which was a church school, um, and it was all about making sure that uh, my grades were kept good, kept up with the work, um, and was in that sort of top percentage of the class of, of always being um or excelling at all the subjects. Were you into any sports or anything? Um, not particularly. Yes, I would enjoy running. I used to play football. Um, would enjoy the activities in the kind of um, sort of teamwork side of things and being able to interact with my friends to win something. So absolutely, I wasn't one of the um, girls that sat by the side and pretended that I had an injury. I was always willing to get involved and try my best and, and win. Okay. You spoke about being seen as a teacher's pet. Did that bother you? Not at all. Uh, my small group of friends were all of the very much the same mindset and wanted to achieve as much as possible in the school, so always seen as high flyers, always chosen to sort of do all the readings or presentations within the school, um, and looked at um, or looked up as sort of role models for the younger years coming through through the school. Okay, that's interesting. When did you realise that you wanted to be into the pharmaceutical industry? Um, it wasn't until I um, did my A-levels, to be fair. Um, I took uh, chemistry, physics and maths for my A-levels and was fortunate enough to go to a private sixth form um, under a scholarship. So um, it's... The, the, the actual sixth form itself was very much divided down the middle. You had those girls that had chosen sort of science subjects and, and were sort of heading down that line. So either medicine or um, sort of academia with biochemistry or um, obviously being uh, scientists in, as in physicists or geologists. And then there were the other side of the common room who were the artsy um girls who sort of chose um, subjects like you know art or um, uh, DT or um, history, English, literature or language. Um, and so my group of friends that I sort of hung around with um, when I was at sixth form, most of us had come from external schools so there were a lot of girls that had gone from the prep school to the to the private school and then into the private sixth form but as we were outside as we kind of stuck together um, and I didn't really want to do the hands-on sort of side of medicine but I did want to use my science subjects so I'd studied as an A-level student um, so I looked into where I could actually utilize what I'd learned at a level and um, actually put it into a vocation so you know nursing and, and being a doctor is mostly around touching patients examining them etc and I, I wasn't sure that I was able to do that or was going to be able to stomach doing it so I decided to take a much more kind of hands-off but still involve rolling and getting people better. So talking about roles what is it exactly you do? So I am a pharmacist, so a practicing pharmacist working in an NHS hospital. I'm a specialist pharmacist. I've been qualified 15 years plus now. 
um, and have been the um, lead antimicrobial pharmacist at an NHS trust in, in the UK, in South London. Um, what my role involves specifically is looking at the use of antimicrobials within the hospital, making sure it adheres to guidelines and national um, so restrictions. Antimicrobials? So antimicrobials are anything to, that deals with infection, infection. so that can be um, a bacterial infection, it can be a fungal infection, or it can be a viral infection, m much like uh, COVID has sort of been an infection that we probably are most fami familiar with at the moment. Um, so my job is to basically um, assist doctors in treating those infections in individuals where they need to be treated. So in hospital, they've usually, or patients have usually gotten to a state where they're going to need some kind of intervention, um, usually of a pharmaceutical version. And what I do is I help to guide the prescribing, make sure that they're giving the right drug at the right dose for the right duration and in accordance with our antimicrobial guidelines. So those will be basically guidelines that tell us what bugs are prevalent within the local area um, and will be dependent on what kind of microbiological advice we've had from the labs. So we've got consultant microbiologists that hate, help aid in that. So am I to understand that there's always somebody who's just checking what these microbugs are in what area, local area? and then they give the report to your people like yourselves? So it wouldn't necessarily be a specific report. So in every NHS trust, there will be a lab um, that actually does or takes in samples, be that blood samples, urine samples, swabs, blood samples, um, to check for the presence of microorganisms. Those would be the bugs that are causing infections in, in patients. It's not generally, um, necessary to do for all infections because there are some uh, you know the samples that would be available just wouldn't give us any useful information so say for instance if you had a chest infection we wouldn't necessarily take your sputum and look at what's um, in your chest because we'd probably effectively get whatever's in your throat and that's not going to tell us what's causing the infection within your chest um, but there are other cases like where you'll have an infection in a wound in your foot you take a swab we'll be able to locate whether or not that um, wound is infected due to an organism that sits in there. Um, the lab will take those samples, they will look after the, or look at and examine them and the results will be sent out to some kind of healthcare professional, usually a doctor, and that will be done for the local region. Um, so we work in unison with them to see what has been grown that is significant and dependent on a patient's clinical condition and the history we'll then use that report to guide whether or not we need to treat with antibiotics and if so, what antibiotic. Okay, it's quite interesting. Um, what kind of personality do you need to do your job? Um, for my role specific, you obviously have to understand and know your stuff, know whatever your basis is. So for me, it's um, microbiology. For other pharmacists, it may be um, respiratory diseases or chest diseases for others it may be women and children's health so you have to have a good background knowledge in the area that you're a specialist if you're a generalist pharmacist again it's about having a, a good understanding for all specialities all types of medicine be that chest be that heart um, be it uh, diabetes um, and then you have to have the confidence to be able to challenge a doctor sometimes somebody that may be three or four times your age to ask them why they've prescribed in the manner in which they've prescribed if you think that it's not right. Um, so you do have to be quite... Um, how does that usually go down? It depends on how you approach it. If you know your stuff and you're asking the right questions and you're engaging with the doctors then that goes down quite well because effectively you want to make that patient better. So they receive it as they see it and you ask questions that are actually useful rather than just very blanket questions because if you don't know what you're talking about they'll very quickly um, unravel that in you. Okay, so you kind of, you've got to be able to research your stuff at the start so when you get there you can build a good reputation for yourself. Yeah, yeah, you have to have a good rapport with the doctors and you have to go in there with tact. There's a way which you address people which means that they're going to be more accepting and receptive of what you've got to say rather than just going in and telling them what you've done is wrong. 
happens that it may be that it is wrong but it's how you get that conversation going and how you engage them for you to both get a sort of optimal end so you, for instance you could suggest the alternative jug and just give the reasons why <laughs> and um, say that would supersede what the other drug is and if they're any capable doctor they would be able to accept that and say yeah I see what you're talking about yeah or equally if they want to not accept it then they they or you they can give you a reason why they can volunteer that information or you can ask them the reason why they've gone with the preference and then you argue your case and it's all about you know evidence-based medicine so who who outranks who in like who has the final say ultimately whoever it is that's looking after the patient from a doctor point of view will have the ultimate say in what medicines they get however i have a professional responsibility to ensure that whatever the patient is getting is going to work for them um, and it's not going to cause them harm so if the case is that i'm going to cause them harm i'm well within my rights to say no i will not provide that drug because i do not think it's going to actually benefit the patient um, and refuse to give them and therefore the doctor can't if they can prescribe drugs they can't give it out they they don't have if they don't have access to the drug then no so you so overall then you, it's not a case of you win but your your what you say super, will supersede just by the fact that the government has done it um laid out through the nhs trust that you have that power to stop doctors let's say making mistakes or you no know, a big part of our job is recognizing errors and making sure that that medicines that shouldn't be given aren't given okay if you're speaking to a young person yep what would you what route would you tell them to um, go down education wise what education would they need to get into your industry in order to become a pharmacist you, you as far as I know things are currently changing with apprenticeships etc but the route that I still believe stands is you you get your A-levels, you then... What would, ones? So most universities would want you to have chemistry as a compulsory and then have at least two other sciences and include maths because a lot of what we do is around calculating doses and getting mm -hmm. that right. So you do have to have a good understanding of basic concepts of maths. Um, so you, you probably need to have at least four A-levels of... Um, I'd say A to C grade or whatever the equivalent is now. You then get yourself into a university and the course that leads to pharmacy directly is an MPharm, so Masters in Pharmacy. Um, and that's a four year course at university. Um, once you've actually completed those four years and you graduate with an MPharm, in order for you to practice as a pharmacist, you then have to undertake a pre-registration year. So this is a year of on-the-job training for you to basically fulfill, I believe it's 52 competencies as, um, as required by the General Pharmaceutical Council. So you work through the year, you work through the competencies, you will either work in community, pharmacy or in a hospital or within industry to fulfill these generic competencies. Um, you will have a tutor who will assess you at various points within the year. I think it's 26 um, weeks, 39 weeks, and then at the end of the 52 weeks, and then you have to sit a pre-registration exam, mm -hmm. uh, which again can be based around any sector of pharmacy, community or hospital or industry, and involves you basically knowing what we call our Bible, the British National Formula, which is every drug that's available in the UK. Every drug? Every drug. That's a lot. Hell of a lot. Okay. And you know, I take it throughout your career, you're always doing, um, what do you call it? Um, so we're always doing continuous professional yeah. development. Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. So basically, we, we once you've sat the exam, you've passed the registration, you pay a registration free every year to practice, but then you also have to fulfill... Um, you pay a registration fee? Yes, we have to pay a year Why? to registrate in order to practice. That doesn't make sense. It does, we're on the general pharmaceutical practice. Will you serve in the country? Um, but we have to pay to be registered as pharmacists. Surely if you've passed your all your qualifications. Okay, well... Yeah. All right. So I... you, you pay your registration fee so you can practice and call yourself a pharmacist, because it's a title. 
Mm. Um, and there is governance that means that by actually saying that you are part of that register, you are abiding by certain rules. So every year we have to make a declaration about our practice and we also have to um, do our revalidation, mm -hmm. which is all around showing that we are still competent to practice as, as pharmacists, effectively yeah. be able to give out those drugs. Okay. Yeah, so when, when you're looking at medication, there's, you know, there's your shop-bought medicines that you can buy off the counter or from your um, uh, nearest garage um, or sweet shop. You then have your drugs that have to be sold in the presence of the pharmacist. And then you have your prescription-only medicines that have, can only be given against the prescription. Okay. okay. And even within those prescribed drugs, there are different classifications and different restrictions. So basically being registered means that you can give out those medicines. Okay. Last couple of questions. You've been a great guest. What motivates you? Um, I guess it's that satisfaction in know that, knowing that you've achieved something or helped someone. Um, I think my best days um, working are where I've felt that I've actually done the job I'm paid to do and I've made a difference. So if I've, able to, I've been able to help, you know, two or three people achieve what they need to achieve um, by being that liaison either within the hospital or within the department, then that makes me feel like I'm, I'm making a difference. Mm -hmm. Even if my patient's there and I've chosen the regime and that patient gets better, if the wound is improved or if the infection, in fact, looks like it's been cured and that patient is home or going home, then that motivates me to keep doing it because although it may like it may feel like I'm not doing anything, it's all my small little bits of work that are actually making a difference. There, obviously, you, you see loads of different wounds, infections, and things like that. What are the most common things you see? What are the causes of them, and how can they be prevented? This is obviously for the audience. Okay, um, so the most common types of infections. Um, that we see are probably urinary tract infections um, which get so bad that patients are having to be admitted um, probably respiratory tract infections and pneumonias um, commonly in people that have got respiratory disease so people that perhaps have um, got a history of asthma or what we call chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD which often happens as a result of smoking um, at some stage in your life. Um, and particularly in diabetic patients, wound infections. So poor control of diabetes um, and then the management of the subsequent wounds that then develop. Um, urinary tract infections can happen to any of us, very common in ladies. Um, can be very self-limiting so you don't need to have antibiotics it's just a matter of good oral intake lots of water flushing that system out same for men like cranberry juice and things like that yeah cranberry juice is, is the, 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 the um the, the jury is out on the usefulness of that but just drinking water and making sure that you keep <laughs> okay <laughs> you keep cranberry yourself flushed. just losing stock value straight away <laughs> okay, okay they didn't sponsor me um all right. Respiratory infections, of course, don't smoke. You know, if you if you are unfortunate enough to to have asthma and have, you know have that as a either as a child or as an adult, manage your symptoms, manage your condition, use your inhalers, make sure that you're aware of your triggers. Some people asthma is worse in you know when they've been cleaning dusting, for instance, or if they've been out riding and there's lots of congestion. So know your triggers and manage your disease. Don't just assume that because you're not experiencing those symptoms that the disease has disappeared. Use the medicines that make sure that your lungs are kept as clear as possible. And just try and keep healthy. Keep that immunity up, make sure you exercise, um, make sure you eat well. Um, uh, with diabetes, again, it's around that diabetic control. Look at what you're putting into your body. Ensure that you're actually taking the medication if you're unlucky enough to be on educa uh, medication. If you've got diabetes as a result of, of being overweight, which is sometimes the case with type 2 diabetes, lose some weight. See what you can do to reverse the condition. 
And if you do have it and it's bad, then do maintain that medication that keeps everything in check. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Last two questions. Mm -hmm. What have you learnt that you wish you knew when you started in this industry? Oh. What have I learnt that I wish I knew? Um, probably that it doesn't hurt not to know everything all the time. Nobody can know everything, nobody's perfect. And you learn the most when you share the fact that you don't know. Ask those questions. Speak to people. Don't be shy. Don't feel intimidated because you don't know something. Be open. Be honest. Ask as many questions as possible and build those foundations early on. Do the additional reading. Get the exposure. Um, you know, step outside of your comfort zone so that you are forever learning more and more. Okay. every opportunity okay and the final last question is what's the impact you want to have on the world oh uh, on the world yes the world um i think i would want my legacy just to be um that i was helpful to others and that was kind okay well thanks a lot for that and we wish you well. Thank you very much. We hope you liked that interview. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to get the latest daily episode. Ever considered investing in the continent with the fastest growing economy and population on Earth? The same continent that holds 30% of the world's known natural resources? Then listen to our sister podcast, Africa Investor Stories, where you will hear real investors with real stories from around the world share their experience of investing in Africa. We post Monday and Thursday at 10am.